What's up guys? My name is Manik Madan and I scored a 260 on the US Money Step 1. And this video is about the seven steps on how to score a 260 and above on the US Money Step 1. So let's start. The first step on how to score a 260 and above on the US Money Step 1 is smashing that heart button down there. Guys, I put my heart and soul into this and I want your heart and soul into this too. So show me some love. But don't press it too hard because you don't want to break that heart. Did they get the joke? You, you think they got it? Okay, so the, so, the, so the real step is to believe in yourself. See, if you do not believe in it, it won't happen. To life, in life, whatever happens, the first step, the journey, the first step begins with believing. And the second step is putting in all the hard work and getting that done. And I've heard so many people tell about that they're not intelligent, that they're not smart enough, that they are basically dumb. And you know, if, if you put limitations on yourself, if you tell yourself that thing every single day, your subconscious picks up on that and that's gonna hurt you for life. So, so just believe in yourself. And just, just, just to let you know, I believe in you. I totally, totally believe in you. You can do anything, right? So the second step is about having a lot of cocaine with you because to power on your beliefs and put in all the hard work, you're gonna need a lot of cocaine, my friend. And you're gonna, you're gonna need to smuggle it. Wait, we can't talk about cocaine? But I just said it, I just said it. Okay, okay, so, so no cocaine guys, I was just kidding, no cocaine needed. So the real step two, is basically getting the right resources. For step one, there's the gold standard of resources called UFAP. Learn that, my friend. For step one, UFAP. UWorld, First Aid, and Pathoma, right? So UWorld is the question bank for step one. First Aid is the book for step one. Pathoma is actually a supplement to First Aid, so it's pretty important too, but I'll go over your world in the end because I want to save it for the end. Right now, I want to talk about first aid. So first aid is super, super important for step one. And you want to really, not, like really, really nail first aid. And you want to make sure you know everything on first aid. For that, you're going to need something called Boards and Beyond. Boards and Beyond is by uh, this doctor called Dr. Ryan. He's a cardiologist in the US and he explains everything in first aid so, so well. And BNB videos, they follow the pattern of first aid and they go according to first aid and that is so, so, so amazing. And what else you can do to make sure that you can complement first aid is use this thing called Sketchy. So Sketchy is basically visual mnemonics for first aid. So you have Sketchy Micro, you have Sketchy Farm, you have Sketchy Path, and they're pretty, all, all very, pretty good. Step three, caution banks. And for caution banks, you'd be like, Monik, you world. And I'd be like, you world. And you'd be like, you world. And I'd be like, you world. But you wanna keep you world for the end. And the reason why you wanna do that, I'll reveal that in the step six. But for right now, I wanna tell you about other caution banks that are really good to do along with first aid. So one of the best caution banks to do along with first aid is this caution bank called USMLE RX. So USMLE RX is by the first aid team itself and it follows it and it follows the pattern of first aid and it's so so good because once you do questions from it and you see your explanations and answers, they kind of give the first aid page down there and you can go back to first aid and read that up. So it's a very good way to revise first aid in a question based manner. I call this QFAR, question based first aid revision. It's pretty good, try it out. Other question banks that are really good are basically Amboss and Kaplan. The reason you wanna do question banks though is because question banks like they kind of teach you how to do a differential diagnosis and if if that differential diagnosis comes as two options you you just learn on how to come to the answer better with question banks because just think about sarcoidosis and tb both of them present similarly with cuff and stuff and again both of them have bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy and you kind of confuse that and you, like and question banks teach you so so well on how to differentiate these kind of things and that's why 
Question banks are a must. Try to do as many as question banks you can get your hands on. That would be my recommendation. Four is the right question solving strategy. So the best question solving strategy for you assembly step one is this question solving strategy called tactical empathy. So tactical empathy is about having empathy with the question writer and asking yourself, what is the question writer trying to ask me? When you go through that MCQ, ask, try to get into the writer's head and ask yourself, what are they trying to ask me? What concept do they want me to elicit? And what is the point of this question? What do they want me to differentiate? What do they want me to eliminate and come like, you know, and what do they want me to do? So that's one of the best ways to approach a question is through the writer's own mindset and through the writer's eyes. Pretty, pretty important. And this is gonna make all the difference sometimes. So try it out, it's pretty amazing. Step is elimination. So when you go and write your assembly step one, never is it ever gonna happen that you're gonna know the answer to all the questions. And you're, you'll be like, Manik, if I don't know the answers to a lot of questions, then how do I come to the answers to questions I don't know the answers to? Well, there's a way to do that, and that's called elim elimination. So elimination is basically ruling stuff out. What that means is if A, B, C, D are the answer choices and B is the answer, you rule A and C and D out. How do you rule stuff out is basically either by age, sex, history, physical examination findings, laboratory examination findings, pretty good ways to rule stuff out. I'll give you an example. So let's think about this thing called osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a disease of old aged people, correct? If you see in the question stem it's written, that a 12 year old kid presents with bone pain and a fracture and somewhere in the answer choice is osteoporosis is given. You'd be like, can osteoporosis be the answer? And the answer is no. You have, so what happens with USMLE is USMLE tests you on the most common clinical presentations of the diseases, right? So osteoporosis presents in oldest people. And it is highly unlikely that that kid, that 12 year old kid has osteoporosis. So you can rule out osteoporosis, right? So let's talk about SLE, right? So if in the question stem, they give you that there's a male who has a kind of polyarthritis throughout his body and somewhere in the answer choices the, uh, the, uh, is SLE, right? Probably that is not the answer because SLE presents mostly in females. That's how USMLE operates. And question banks teach this very well. So go through a lot of question banks to develop this ability to see what happens in what. Pretty, pretty important. Next, UWorld. UWorld is the best question bank for US only step one. And I totally agree with that. But how you approach UWorld is going to make a very, very big difference on what score you get on step one. Doing UWorld in tutor mode or doing it system wise or trying to do it subject wise is not recommended because it does not help. First of all, you wanna simulate USMLE every single day. And to simulate USMLE every single day, you need to put it on timed mode. You want to put that pressure of time, the ticking clock on yourself, super, super important. And because that's gonna be the same way on your step one. You're gonna have a limited time and you need to perform. The same thing you need to do with your world. Second, do your world in random. Do not do it system wise. The reason I say that is because let's assume you're doing a cardiology block, right? If you're doing a cardiology block and the patient probably has pulmonary edema, the answer probably is heart failure. I'm not kidding, go and try to do this. You'll start seeing this pattern. The thing is when you're doing stuff like uh, system wise, you subconsciously pick up on these answers because you know you're doing a cardiology block and the answer probably is heart failure, not pneumonia, not probably ARDS, but heart failure. So look for that. And just know that USMLE itself is random and you wanna simulate that random. So US, USMLE does not give you stuff system-wise. It, it's not like behavioral sciences, then we go to you know, cardiology, we go to neuro, no. It's all totally random. Stuff comes up in random. So train yourself to solve random questions, okay? I told you before to keep your word in the end. The reason you wanna keep it in the end is because 
The purpose of you, your world is basically to simulate US MLE. And you wanna make sure you're totally ready. You have learned stuff from other quotient banks, you have learned quotient solving strategies from other quotient banks, and you've learned the, the common patterns like stuff presents in, like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, and you can recognize clues. Clues like if cardiopulmonary examination is normal, probably the answer is not heart failure, it probably the answer is not pneumonia because cardiopulmonary examination is normal. So you wanna test these things, that you're applying the right concepts, your clue recognition is tuned in, your pattern recognition is tuned in. And just use your world as an assessment tool, like a self-assessment tool. And I think that really, really helps. And people who score above 260, really, really, I think most of the people I've met who have scored above 260, used it as a assessment tool, not as just primary question bank. Guys, you made it. This is the last and the final step. That is the seventh step. And this is about practice tests. So practice tests are super, super important for your assembly step one. And you wanna make sure that you're consistent on your score and that you can do by doing NBMEs. So NBMEs are these practice tests that are similar to USMLE step one pattern. And the good thing about them is that they're written by the same people who write USMLE. And that is amazing, right? So NBMEs are perfect for getting into the mindset of the quotient writers of the USMLE step one, number one. They're amazing for building consistency to see that your score is becoming consistent and it's increasing, increasing, and not decreasing any time. And they're amazing for building confidence so that once you reach your dream score and you, because NBMEs are so, so accurate, very probable that what you get on your NBME will be the same as your result on your SMLE step one. So make sure you nail those NBMEs down and make sure like even if you, so when you wanna start NBMEs, it's basically three months before the test. That's how I did it. And try to do as many as you can because the, one of the main purposes of NBME is to get into the writer's head and try to understand how quotients are written and how quotients can come from for the USMLE step one and how these examiners think and what kind of quotients can they give you. Super, super important. Three months before the exam, start doing it then because if you do a lot of NBMEs, it becomes like a quotient bank itself. And I think that massively helps. So guys, have an amazing day. You can DM me your qu uh, queries if you have some, uh, and my account will be provided down there, and feel free to just DM me, and have an amazing day, man.